See, my name is Thomas Bird. I'm an orthopedic surgeon from Nashville, Tennessee. The youngest of six children. We all live there within one mile radius of the house we were born in. The uh, practice in orthopedic surgery there. Mostly, my background is mostly in sports medicine. I actually did a sports medicine fellowship and then did a total joint fellowship, but I only did the total joints because I figured enough people come limping in to see the sports medicine doc that really need a total joint that either ought to do a good job with them or send them on. But actually, I hadn't done a total joint in about 10 years, so my background is mostly sports medicine that just sort of morphed into this hip arthroscopy stuff. I'm afraid it's not a very inspiring story. Actually, no, you know, I, I kind of went off to college with no plan other than I ought to go and uh, became a chemistry major because I was a very slow reader and chemistry was the one that had the least volume of reading. I could retain the same amount whether it was a chemistry book or a Tom Sawyer novel. But, uh, so I was a chemistry major and then as I started to complete my degree in chemistry, I'm like, well, what do you do with a chemistry major? And my father is a general surgeon said, you know, you ought to you know, apply to medical school just for kicks. So I applied to one school and oddly enough got in and uh, so not a very inspiring story. Well, I, I'd say that there, there's nothing I've done that was very obvious. It's, I've just sort of gone the way the trails have taken me. And the same thing with hip arthroscopy. It wasn't something I set out to do. Uh, but one day, one of my partners had a 16-year-old kid with loose bodies in his hip from a acetabular fracture two years before. And she was going to do an arthrotomy to take them out. And said, well, what do you think about trying to take these out arthroscopically? I thought, well, I've never heard of such a thing, never seen one. But I thought, well, hey. We'll try, as long as we don't do something dumb like cut the femoral nerve, if it doesn't work, then you can flip him over and do your arthrotomy and be done with it. But we went in arthroscopically and basically I just used the skills and principles that Dr. Andrews had taught me as a sports medicine doctor and which involved a lot of arthroscopy and it worked. We got the loose bodies out and that was kind of the sentinel case upon which we started. You know, what excites me about this field is the number of brilliant, young, innovative guys coming along, some really smart guys. Because when we started with this, there was a couple of us cowboys out there trying it. But really, you knew the handful of people that were doing it. And we could go speak together. We could give each other's talks because we knew what each other were going to say. But now we've got some true clinical scientists, people with brilliant scientific minds getting involved. And I think we're, we're clearly just barely scratching the surface on where this is heading not because of me, but what these young people are going to bring along. I, I think the sky's the limit. You know, I, I think clearly uh, FAI is incompletely understood because FAI as a concept is too simple. Uh, it certainly helps us to explain when we see somebody who's getting into trouble with their hip and they have radiographic features of FAI, we can explain, yes, this is why you got into trouble. But we'll see master's level athletes, people in their 70s and 80s, competing at high levels for decades with all sorts of odd looking hips that never ever develop symptoms. And that's a group we need to study because that's a group I want to be part of is how are some people lifelong compensators? So we really understand so poorly exactly FAI alone. A lot more we need to do to understand that. And we're just barely starting to extend from the intraarticular compartment outside the joint to the soft tissues arthroscopic procedures are transitioning to endoscopic procedures for lots of disorders around the hip joint. My answer is no. I don't feel like that there's ever some detour that we made where we got off on this tangent that turned out to be really bad or we are harming people. We've had a couple things that didn't work real well but these were, most times, we're sort of the court of last resort for people they have got no other options. And we've potentially got something to offer them. And most times we've been able to come out on top. We've been able to improve people's lives. But what we're shooting for now isn't just palliative procedures, but we're shooting for preventative procedures, hoping that we can not only improve the quality of their lives, but hopefully try to improve whatever the future may hold for them. And, I think relative to hip arthroscopy, uh, unfortunately I was so ignorant when I started, uh, I, I sort of made do with the technique that I could just make work. And it wasn't until after I'd done a few that I realized that there were other people with some, some techniques that had been developed. And I did my first one in 1990. 
I had done several by the time I arrived here in Cambridge for the first time in 1992 when uh, Richard Villa hosted the first international course on hip arthroscopy where there were probably about a dozen people here. Jim Glick was here, Enar Erickson, a handful of other people, Joe McCarthy. And I realized that there were other folks that we could collaborate with. By then, I'd already developed my own technique that seemed to be working. And I remember when in 1994 we published my technique using the supine position. And when the editor of the journal sent me the letter accepting my paper for publication, he hand wrote on there, this, this is good work, Thomas. Uh, but you're going to find the difficult cases where you're going to have to learn to use the lateral decubitus position. Well, I'm still waiting. If you want to get busy doing hip arthroscopy, you don't have to go out and lecture to people about how good you are doing hip arthroscopy. You just need to go out and lecture to them about how to evaluate hip problems and how to diagnose hip problems because most of the problems that could be treated by people going into practice they're not robbing those patients from somebody else across town. Most of the patients that could benefit from this technique and technology, many of them are going unrecognized and untreated. So there's, there's such an unknown pool out there of potential cases. So people, that's where people going into practice can get busy just through the process of educating the community on how to recognize these disorders. You know, it, it, it's, it is a joy as you, as, you know, certainly the, the professional athletes and you watch them on TV and coming back, but, but certainly in my world, I think the, the absolute happiest patients that I work with as a population are the elderly people with abductor tears that are severely disabled. Because as I started this, I used to run the other way from lateral hip pain because they were old people, they were miserable, and they're hard to sort out. Well, I figured out only two of those three things were true. They're, they're not that hard to sort out, but they are elderly people and they're severely disabled. But they tend to be one of the happiest patient populations. When we look at their outcome scores and numbers, their scores as far as the amount of improvement, the delta, is double that of what we can accomplish with FAI. So a very gratifying patient group. And, and, and certainly with, with the abductor repairs, we, we look at our hug factor. The hug factor with these patients is, is astronomically higher than any, any other groups. But to me, I, I think as I watch a, an athlete or anybody who's getting back to intense activities, oftentimes it may have contributed to why they got into trouble. More than anything else, I just hold my breath and hope I'm not watching the day and the days something goes bad. So I, I think that it's very hard for me to let my guard down and say, oh, this is great. I can't believe how well that person's doing. I'm doing such a great job. I just be grateful and hope it holds up.